Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 65 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Before we get started with another super interesting interview, it's time for me to let you know about a sweet deal just for you from Skillshare, because learning is pretty much my favorite thing. Skillshare has over 20,000 classes to take online, so you can keep yourself busy learning everything from drawing to writing to how to become more productive. Their classes are offered as videos and Zoom workshops, and if you're feeling social, you can join groups to help keep you learning and keep you motivated. Sound good? Why not check it out? Friends of the Medieval Podcast can try Skillshare for free for two whole months. Find out what sort of learning is waiting for you at medievalist.net slash Skillshare. At the end of my latest book, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, I mentioned that one of the things that we know for sure about the Middle Ages is that people wanted to be remembered by future generations. By us. We also know that human beings throughout history have loved to create art, whether it's fine art or just doodles to pass the time. Today's episode is about one of those really interesting places where art and memory, serious messages, and playful doodles all intersect. Graffiti. This week, I invited Matthew Champion to give us the lowdown on medieval graffiti. Matt is a busy archaeologist, a heritage consultant, and writer who specializes in the graffiti of England's churches, especially in Norfolk and Suffolk. His book is called Medieval Graffiti, The Lost Voices of England's Churches. Here's our conversation about what sort of images you can find on the walls of a medieval church, just who was tagging, and even a little bit about pandemic graffiti. Well, thank you for joining me, Matt, to talk about medieval graffiti. Now, I have to ask how you got interested in medieval graffiti as something to spend your time studying. How did it start for you? Well, it started in it started in church, but it didn't start with the graffiti. It started with medieval wall paintings. I was running a project at a small church on the Norfolk Suffolk border, a tiny little village called Lakenheath. And um, Lake and Heath Church was absolutely crammed packed full of wall paintings, um, dating from about 1300 all the way through to about 1850. So they had about six different schemes. And whilst running this project, myself and the conservators noticed that we had graffiti on some of the wall paintings on some of the walls. And some of it was clearly pre-Reformation in origin. So, you know, wanting to know more about this, I, you know, did the usual thing, hit the libraries and realized there was very, very little written about this. And I was just um, lucky, I guess, after that. I um, I got in contact with uh, a gentleman called John Peake, who I, I'd known for years, but he'd been studying early graffiti up at the churches on the North Norfolk coast. And he said, oh, come and spend a day with me. So I did. And yeah, that was over a decade ago. And I've been um, stuck in churches ever since looking at graffiti. (laughs) Um, You know, we thought it was fairly rare. You know, when we began doing this um, and when we began the county surveys, we thought that, you know, early graffiti was going to be fairly rare. Um, But once you start looking, it's everywhere. You know, Norfolk alone has got, uh, you know, over 650 medieval churches. And half of them, at least, have got a good amount of graffiti in them. The general rule of thumb we have these days is uh, if it hasn't been kind of too messed about with by the Victorians and it isn't you know, still covered in lime wash, then there'll be early graffiti present. And in some cases, we're talking about hundreds of inscriptions just in one building. That's crazy. Well, you're bringing up something that I think we need to address kind of early on, and that is how do you know that it's medieval graffiti instead of later graffiti? Because you're saying some things are clearly pre-Reformation. How do you know? How do you date it? Yeah, dating is always the most tricky. A lot of it isn't medieval, obviously. we yeah, The name medieval was a good title for a book and a good sort of cover all. But we record everything. So any inscription on the building, even those created last week, and there are some, we record the whole lot. So, you know, we're, we're creating a kind of baseline survey. In terms of dating the graffiti, well, sadly, people don't start leaving dates on graffiti, actual written dates, until uh, largely into the 16th century. There's a, you know, there's a handful of medieval dates, but most of them don't really start till the 16th, and it becomes common or commonplace in the 17th. So, you know, we, we can date dated graffiti, obviously. The other stuff, we have to rely on a number of different factors. Text, then it's the hand that's being used, the style of lettering, letter forms, that kind of thing. 
in some cases we can date it from the actual fabric itself. So at Spinham Priory up in North Norfolk, we have an architectural scheme there and it's you know, etched into the walls, but it is, um, it's etched into 12th century fabric, but it's partially concealed by a 14th century paint layer. So we know that it must sit between those two dates. Another local church, one of the first ones we looked at, Litcham, we know there that the piers were um, built in 1412. So the pillars of the church were built in 1412. They were consecrated on St Botolph's Day, which I can't remember the date. But then it received its first coat of lime wash at the Reformation in about 1547, you know, in common with a lot of East Anglian churches. Now, if you go to Litcham today, the lime wash is peeling away from the wall, literally layers and layers of it flaking away. And emerging out from beneath that lime wash are graffiti inscriptions. So we know they must date somewhere between 1412 and 1547. And that's that's pretty good dating. You know, in, in other cases, we have to use, you know, what's actually depicted. So people, clothes, things like that the architecture. But a lot of the time, you know, the best we can possibly say is, you know, it it belongs to, you know, this couple of centuries or that couple of centuries. It's pretty imprecise. Yeah, but it sounds like it's a lot of interesting detective work to try and figure out what the dates are from. So you're saying that a lot of churches have graffiti in them. Why do you think people are doing their doodling, not even doodling, because a lot of the things that you've mentioned are very important graffiti. It's not just somebody's board but why are they picking the church as a place to write their graffiti or carve their images well i don't think they are just using the church when we look at our vernacular buildings and our surviving castles our stately homes anything like that they're also covered in graffiti so i think it was safe to say they were using any surface that they could write on it was just another fabric to write in a lot of the stuff we see in churches is particularly related to christianity so a lot of it's devotional in nature. We get a lot of prayers, that kind of thing. So it's really the subject matter that's fitting for the site, I suppose. But no, there are still also doodles there as well. And there are just the messages on the wall, people wanting to make their mark. So I think if you think about how much we've lost from the medieval period in terms of fabric, whenever we do come across surviving fabric, we find the graffiti with it as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And you've said that this is something at the the introduction to your book, you've said that this is something that is not exclusive to one social class, that all social classes are carving marks into walls. So what gives you the idea that it's everybody that is carving their mark into a wall? Well, due to kind of literacy levels in the Middle Ages, it's actually easier to kind of pin it on the upper classes and the educated classes because they're the ones that are writing on the wall. If you look at a church like Troston, just over the border into Suffolk, we've got a name on the wall there, which is the Lord of the Manor. We've also got a lot of priests. A lot of parish priests appear to have, uh, you know, marked their own churches. And that that's almost got relevance with modern graffiti kind of tagging almost, making their mark, appropriating those spaces. Uh, in places, uh, you know, down into uh, Essex, we have one local vicar there, Richard Le Grice, who recorded all the building works he had done in the church. And, you know, he, it's wonderful for a buildings archaeologist, you know, who needs to enter a day thing? <laughs> he literally marked down all the building works on the wall, commemorating the fact that he did it. And I guess that he paid for it as well. So it's um, really leaving his uh, his testament on the walls. Yeah, that's really interesting. I was thinking of that as being what kind of graffiti are people doing now? It's often writing their own names, tagging stuff, like you said. And it's interesting people are writing their own names. Is that something that they're choosing to add to a building, their own names? It's certainly what we see with the vicars. It's certainly what we see with some of the upper educated classes. What you've got to remember, and obviously there are lots of arguments about how literate people were during the Middle Ages, but those um, yeah, those lower orders who may not have been fully literate, we don't tend to see a great deal of you know, name graffiti. There's a lot more of it as imagery. So text makes up about 5-10% of all the inscriptions we come across. It really is, you know, it's not as common as it would be today. The rest is all image-based. Yeah, and that brings me exactly into where I wanted to go, which is what do you see? What kind of things are people writing on walls? Not just their names, but what you see kind of most often that people are writing. Uh, most often, well, it's everything you can possibly imagine. There's, you know, when you think you haven't seen something, it turns up. We get a, a wide variety in the same way you would in, you know, if you gave a, a class of school kids 
a whole bunch of paper and crayons and said draw stuff um, you would get a wide and diverse collection and that's what we're seeing on our churches it's interesting in some cases is what we're not seeing so when you look at say um, the animals and we get a lot of animals and birds um, you know all on across the walls we're not seeing the the stuff that you'll see in you know, the marginalia of medieval manuscripts we're not really seeing the fabulous beasts we're not seeing the dragons the griffins the wyverns one or two examples of each across the entire country we are seeing um, a lot of hawks a lot of running hounds a lot of horses that kind of thing but we're not seeing the kind of regular animals of the farmyard. So we're not seeing the pigs, the cattle, the sheep. We're just seeing the, the kind of aspirational animals, the animals of the hunt, that kind of thing. Um, not finding sheep really is, you know, in East Anglia, that, that's quite an unusual thing. You know, half of our churches around here are, are built on the profits from the wool trade. Sheep were you know, massively important to the local economy. I don't think I've come across one inscription of a sheep. I found one pig which was already kind of known about. But horses, hunting hounds, hawks, that kind of thing. Yeah, we're finding a lot of those. So it's almost like there's an aspirational level to this as well. Yeah, a bit of wishing on the walls because I'm sure that they are tired of looking at sheep from a long day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you really wouldn't want to spend a lot of time drawing sheep, I, I suppose. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we see some quite odd things, a lot of things like heraldry as well. So, you know, heraldry, obviously, it turns up all over, um, you know, medieval art architecture. Most of the heraldry we're getting amongst the graffiti, though, is, is really what we've termed, you know, sort of bastard heraldry. It's really, really poor. It's almost a pseudo heraldry. It's very, very difficult to ascribe any of the individual coats of arms that we come across with individual families. Partly that's because we don't get the pigment and heraldry relies on pigment. But a lot of the time, the heraldic shields and stuff we're coming across are just extremely crude. It's almost like they're uh, aspirational heraldry as well. But we have, you know, started terming it pseudo. Those that bear any resemblance to known heraldry, just a handful. That's really, really interesting, because as you were talking about it, I was thinking maybe this is aspirational as well. And when you give someone crayons and some paper, they're going to draw their dreams, perhaps. And it's interesting that we're seeing people drawing their dreams as well. A lot of the time, it's not so much their dreams. What we are finding on the walls are their fears, the things that they're really worried about. So um, the yeah, our medieval church walls here are absolutely full of graffiti images of demons. We get a lot of the um, devils and demons. And if you think about that, that's, you know, that's kind of what you expect in a medieval church. You know, medieval churches are full of images of kind of angels and demons. You've got your angels in your hammer bin roof, angels in the stained glass. And then you've kind of got your demons in the misericords and the, the wall paintings as well. But what's particularly interesting for me is when you come to look at the graffiti, you only get those demons. You don't get the angels. I haven't found a single example of an angel on any church wall in England but I found dozens and dozens of demons. And I think, you know, what that's telling us about the graffiti is that people are putting what's important to them, what's real to them. People, you know, in the Middle Ages, demons were very, very real. You know, they, they were the, the entities that brought you, you know, misfortune, made you ill, suddenly caused your cattle to drop dead or your sheep. They were kind of the everyday. Angels weren't. Angels belonged in heaven. If you said a prayer, you didn't expect an angel to turn up and answer it in, you know, in person. You know, unless you're Marjorie Kemp, obviously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm hoping that not many of us are Marjorie Kemp because, oof, what a world that would be. So <laughs> when you're talking about <laughs> demons being etched into the walls of a church, do you think that this has to do with sort of leaving your fears there in a kind of protected place? Or do you think that it's perhaps more like, could it be something like defacement? Because when we see graffiti now, sometimes it's meant to make a statement through defacement. And I think vandalism is an interesting word considering like, the roots of vandalism. Do you think that it's perhaps a way of rebelling against the church? Or do you think it's it's more just kind of an expression of those fears? I personally would say it's more of an expression of those fears because, you know, we have this idea of graffiti as rebellion, graffiti as defacement, and that's just a really modern attitude. Okay. Um, you know, that's only really been about since, you know, middle of the 19th century. Prior to that, um, when you look at the evidence, which is all on the walls, 
people really don't have a problem with going out there and you know, making their mark. Middle of the 19th century, that begins to change. And you can you can follow this through the literature. From that point forward, people start to see graffiti as vandalism. They start to see it as destructive. And, um, you know, we still have this paradox today. That on the one hand, we're studying historic graffiti for what it can tell us about the past. And on the other hand, you know, today, people screaming about graffiti being applied all over the United States. And you, know, you can take that a step further by looking at things like the division between graffiti and street art. You know, where does Banksy sit in all of this? Yeah, exactly. And you've seen examples of this being kind of a community expression in which people are adding and adding and adding more stuff, right? You were talking about ship carvings in a particular place where people were expressing their fears and drawing ships and adding to that. Can you talk a bit about those ship carvings? The ships turn up all over the place. Um, when we first started looking for this, um, you know, ship graffiti, it was believed that it was something that was largely confined to coastal areas. And it turned out the reason we thought that is because that's where we were looking for it. <laughs> you know, as soon as we started looking inland, we found that we had a lot of ship graffiti, you know, right in the middle of Leicestershire. For those who don't know the geography, um, you couldn't get further from the sea. But we are still seeing sort of concentrations towards the coast. So um, the, the one you're thinking about, I think, is probably Blakeney up on the North Norfolk coast, which is one of the first places we ever looked at. It's one of the, one of the places I went with John Peake on that very, very first day. And what we have is the entire church is full of early graffiti, but the ship graffiti only turns up on one side of the church. On the first pier at the western end, yeah, there's two or three. The next pier has sort of, you know, seven or eight. Next one has 13. And by the time you get to the last pier, the easternmost pier on the, um, the South Arcade, you've got over 50 different inscriptions. And they sit opposite a now empty image niche and a side altar. Now, we know those particular ships were created over quite a long period of time. The architecture, naval architectural historians tell us that we're looking at, you know, a couple of hundred years. Uh, and we also know that those um, ships were visible. The early ships were visible when the later ones were created. And the reason we know that is because all of the individual inscriptions respect the space of the other ones around them. So none of them cross over. So when someone was creating one and 200 years after the first one, they could still see the first one. So this is something that was going on for a long period of time. And if they had been seen as vandalism, if they'd been seen as defacement, then at any point in that 200 years, you know, the vicar or the church warden could have come along and um, literally wiped them from the wall. What's particularly interesting there about their placement within the church is that that side altar was dedicated, we believe, to St. Nicholas. And of course, during the Middle Ages, um, St. Nicholas, as well as associations with children and Christmas, was a patron saint of those in peril upon the sea. So um, the current theory, and it's holding good at a number of sites now, is that we're finding concentrations of ship graffiti associated with St. Nicholas chapels and St. Nicholas altars, and that these are devotional. And these are votive in nature, much like the votive ships um, that were hung up in churches during the Middle Ages. These are kind of the poor man's votive ship, as it were. One particular historian has noted that quite a few of these seem damaged and has suggested that each one may represent a ship that was long overdue or never came back. So, you know, each one of those ships may, in fact, represent a crew and, you know, brothers, fathers, sons who never came back. You know, given the number of inscriptions we've got at Blakeney, it's the right sort of number. So would you guess that these were carved before they knew what had happened to the ship as a way of kind of hoping to conjure the ship back, calling it back? Or you think it was kind of a memoriam? It's difficult to say. You know, there's lots of different possibilities. What we do know is that although these votive ships aren't really seen too much in England these days, if you go to some other European countries, they um, were being created until very, very recently. And one of the traditions, I think, in Denmark was that a model of the ship was presented by the captain upon his retirement. So uh, as Thanksgiving for a, um, you know, as Thanksgiving for a, a successful and safe career. But we've also got written evidence from the early 17th century in Scotland where votive ships are being presented to churches as Thanksgiving for having survived a particularly bad storm. And we have similar references in medieval East Anglia as well as um, votive ships made of wax being presented to shrines by sailors, you know, as Thanksgiving 
for having survived a you know particularly rough crossing or something so uh, you know as with most graffiti there could be several things going on yeah i figured that but i thought you might have a guess <laughs> to hazard about it <laughs> oh no i'm gonna sit on the fence on that you know um, there's, it's there's, the safest there's, place well, there's so many uh, there's so many different interpretations, and there's written evidence and documentary evidence that supports different interpretations. So I think there were you know a number of things going on. Yeah, and I think this is a good time to bring up one of the things that you seem to have found in your exploration of church graffiti is you've found ritual protection marks. So you've seen people that are making marks there that are supposed to be protective. And I think this is worth mentioning because so often modern people think there's a, a very clear differentiation between the church and people's beliefs outside of the church. So what kind of things have you seen there as kind of protection marks people have carved into a church? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mm, tricky one, this one. How long do you want to talk on it for? Because <laughs> I, I, could, I could do all day. Um, the ritual protection marks, ritual protection marks is a modern term and it's a, it's a modern descriptive term. A lot of the markings we're finding on the churches, anywhere between sort of 25 and 35 percent of these are all the same marks. They are what are now termed ritual protection marks. However, a lot of these have their origins in um, the Orthodox Church. So, you know, back in the 11th and 12th, 13th century, you're finding the same symbols, the same motifs being used as part of formal decoration. But what happens is they they evolve. They become um, used by the laity, as it were, and they do slightly change the form uh, in which they're, they're used. So if you think about it, a lot of these are derived from the cross or the crucifix. And, um, you know, we talk about these as, um, you know, apotropaic marks, but being derived from the cross, of course, you know, the cross is the ultimate apotropaic mark. It wards off evil, it, it protects. And these, you know, the, these symbols, these rich protection marks, they really tend to draw their potency, as it were, from the cross. So it's really not, it's not separate from the church. It's just a different aspect of the church. It's really kind of a reflection of what's going on at parish level. So while you may have the, the, the scriptures of the church, while you may have orthodox teachings of the church, what's actually happening in the parish is slightly different. And in some places uh, and in some situations, it's slightly skewed as well. So if you talked to a bishop about the power of a communion wafer, he would explain exactly what that power was. At a parish level, that power can then be transferred by um, using it as a folk medicine or scattering it in the fields. So it's it's just different aspects of the same beliefs. You know, we don't have lots of um, weird and wonderful pagan hangovers. What we've really got here is people's interpretation of um, religion and belief. Yeah, and I think that's important to note because as you say, what the bishop says and what's been written down is very different from what it's like when it trickles down to the people <laughs> who are not reading these texts who have not gone to school to learn this stuff. And so you see kind of a difference in between yeah. what what the official line is and what people are actually doing. And it evolves over time as well. We've got really, really great examples of that. If you think about you know, the five-pointed star, the pentangle, today that tends to be associated with witchcraft and the Wiccan movement. But we know that in the late Middle Ages, it's a Christian symbol and it's one of the most Christian symbols. You know, if you read the Pearl Poets, uh, Gawain and the Green Knight, um, he talks about Sir Gawain having this gold pentangle painted on his shield. And the poet then says, right in the middle of the poem, he says, and now I will explain the symbolism of the pentangle, even though <laughs> it will interrupt the flow of my story. And then, you know, he gives us then wonderfully he gives us a complete breakdown of the symbolism of the pentangle in kind of late 14th century Lancashire. So, you know, he says it's a symbol of perfection. It's the seal of Solomon. It represents the five wounds of Christ. It represents the five virtues of the night you know, and on and on. And, you know, what that tells us is, first of all, that those symbols clearly evolve over time because that symbol has gone in the last 500 years from being one of the most Christian symbols to being something associated with witchcraft. So we have a very, very clear example of this evolution of belief. But also the Pearl Poet is telling us very, very clearly that it doesn't just mean one thing. There are multiple interpretations. Simple yes. as that. 
It's always my get out clause. There are multiple interpretations. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking about that um, before I spoke to you about how, you know, in so many fictional things you'll see, there's been something and it's been graffitied in a church and it's the symbol that gives you a clue to something that is a huge conspiracy theory has been going on for thousands of years. I'm still <laughs> looking it, for that, yeah. <laughs> when you find that, you have to let me know. <laughs> have yeah, you back well, on. Well, yeah. But do you, have you noticed that the graffiti that you're seeing do you think that it's mostly speaking to that present moment? So it's an expression of people at that time, or have you seen stuff that you think is forward looking, you know, like some memorials are forward looking and they're saying yeah. for the people in the future, this is what happened. Do you see that forward looking in the graffiti or is it mostly kind of very much in the present moment? Uh, no, um, we definitely see it in the graffiti. Graffiti covers everything. So, you know, we've got our rich protection marks, we've got our architectural inscriptions. But uh, one of the big categories we've really been looking at recently is memorial inscriptions. And they kind of work at two different levels. So on the one level, you've got this need to kind of memorialise events. So um, things that are, you know, large, things that are important, things that they don't really want to, or they don't trust a vellum or parchment. And the obvious example and very relevant example um, would be plague graffiti. So um, we have got quite a few examples. Uh, Ashwell in Hertfordshire is one of the most famous. We've got Akel in Norfolk, where these um, events, these pandemics have been literally, a record of them has been etched into the wall. And it, appears that you know when these events happen people want a permanent record and where else would you do it but at the central and most permanent building in your village which is the church the scariest piece of graffiti i think i've ever come across is um, from steeple bumstead in essex and um, it's repeated in several places around the church and unusually is in england uh, is in english rather and it's just got the date which is um, 1348 and it's just repeated around the church and it just says, God help me, God help me, God help me. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, when, that's when the hairs on the back of your neck go up and you yeah. start thinking there is a Dan Brown novel in this somewhere. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but, you know, on, a, on a much more personal level, we also see those personal memorials. We've come across these going all the way back into pre-Reformation period and all the way through into the 19th century, where people will leave written memorials on churches, in some cases births, but usually it's deaths. And in a lot of these cases, these tend to be the lower orders, as it were, those people who couldn't afford a gravestone or a great memorial. And in some cases, they even echo the language that you'll see on the ledger slabs or the great tombs, or they'll echo the shapes of the, you know, the great wall plaques you see. So these are kind of um, these are memorials of the lower order, as it were. And um, as I say, they continue right the way through into 19th century. And in some cases, of course, these may be the only mark these people have left on this world. They just don't appear elsewhere. Yeah. And I think that's why your work is really important. But I wanted to ask, so these memorial notes, bits of graffiti, are they found in a consistent place in the church? No, they're found all over the church, sometimes on the outside as well. Most of the graffiti on the outside churches today has gone. We know it was there from the few um, surviving examples, but, you know, it gets heavily eroded. A lot of churches were plastered on the outside, so that's now all gone as well. We've seen it on the outside, we've seen it in the towers, we've seen it in the chancel, just about everywhere. So there isn't really a consistent, um, a consistent spot. And you've got to remember that any church we go into, we are only ever seeing a tiny fraction of um, what was once there. Normally, we're just seeing what was on the stonework. When we find a piece of medieval plaster work that survived, because most churches have been replastered multiple times, when we find the medieval plaster, it too is covered in graffiti. So, yeah, the church porch at uh, Troston again in, in Suffolk, absolutely covered in graffiti. And most of that's, you know, 17th century onwards. But, you know, it's a good indication that when we do find medieval, we also find the graffiti. And wall paintings, you know, where we have medieval wall paintings, we'll quite often find medieval graffiti cutting through the wall paintings. Sometimes referencing the wall paintings themselves. So sometimes it's like a conversation. It's a reaction to what's actually going on on the walls. But at other times it's just it's not terribly relevant, shall we say. But they, they don't seem to have had any qualms about cutting into the pigment. And I was in Siena 
back in January in, in northern Italy. And we were looking at the wall paintings in the undercroft of the Duomo there, which again, these fantastic, beautiful frescoes, which were only probably visible for about 70 years. So they had a fairly short lifespan before that chapel was closed up. And they're just covered, absolutely <laughs> covered. <laughs> I have mixed feelings about this, you know, looking at a beautiful piece of art and then seeing this art also imposed on it. You know, it's, it gives you conflicting feelings, I think, or maybe it's just me. <laughs> or, or maybe we should start rethinking what we consider art, you know, yeah, that yes. the wall paintings themselves, you know, they were subjects for devotion. A lot of the graffiti is also a subject for devotion. And it's not just Italy, you know, if you go up to the Prior's Chapel in Durham, there's wonderful wall paintings there, which also covered in graffiti. And I was looking at the church in Suffolk, um, very, very famous set of wall paintings towards the end of last year. And everyone would know the image of the wall paintings, but it's only when you shine the raking light across the surface that you realise they're also covered in graffiti as well. <laughs> yeah, and I think that your your take on it as being a conversation is a very useful one in that you have people who are who are speaking when they don't have a different way to speak or interact with this. Yeah. Okay, we're coming to the end, so let's end with something that is fun. One of the things that you've said you've come across in church graffiti is curses. So what kind of curses are people writing um, in the church? The, the absolutely classical curses. When we were looking at Norwich Cathedral, we had a big team of volunteers there, wonderful volunteers. And um, we came across a number of very, very odd inscriptions. And when I looked at them, uh, having spent quite a lot of time sort of doing field archaeology and Roman archaeology, one inscription in particular I just looked at and went, it's a curse. It's an absolutely classical curse, but it appears to be about 1,500 years out of place. <laughs> so what we get is um, these these take the same form as the Roman curses. So you will get a name or you will get text. A lot of it will be in, inverted or you will get jumbled letters. And it's usually associated with astrological symbols as well. So the Roman ones tend to end up on being on cursed tablets, um, which are usually made of lead. You fold them up, you nail them up to a shrine or you deposit them in a, a you know, ritually in a stream or something. But these are actually carved into the walls of Norwich Cathedral. And we've identified at least three there. And since seeing them there, we've started to go back and look at some of the other text inscriptions, which we thought was gobbledygook and realised that actually we're seeing the same thing. Astrology was very, very important, obviously, during the Middle Ages to do with, you know, um, just about everything, including medicine. And we started to realise we're seeing an awful lot of astrology on the walls of our churches. And some of that is being used in, um, let us say, a, a malign manner. <laughs> we can't obviously give you any guarantees they will work. <laughs> Well, that's important. It's also important to note that astrology was not something that was banned by the church. Could be used for good. It could be used for bad at the time. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you for talking us through medieval graffiti. It's a great pleasure. To find out more about Matt's work, you can visit his website, mjc-associates.co.uk. Or you can follow him on Twitter at mjc underscore associates. For even more medieval graffiti, you can check out his book, Medieval Graffiti, The Lost Voices of England's Churches. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new, Peter? Hey, hey, how are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And I wanted to tell you about this week is a, some things we've had over the last couple of weeks, which is a brand new batch of writers on Medievalist.net. We were able to bring in some new columnists, about five or six of them now, I think. And they're going to be looking at things such as Eastern Europe in the Middle Ages, Scandinavia, the rise of their kingdoms, China in the Middle Ages, as well as peasants in the Middle Ages. Those things have all kind of started up. And we're really excited because it seems like we'll be able to kind of offer you like new content pretty much every day. So a columnist or an article or news, things like that, and the podcast as well. So we're pretty busy. <laughs> That's awesome. So if people want to check out the new content, it's already up and already moving. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We actually have the second piece uh, of our China in the Middle Ages column just went out yesterday. So, yeah, we've got like just kind of tons of things that are ready and we're hoping you enjoy them. Well, I'm sure everyone will enjoy them. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon.com for your continuing support. If you haven't visited our Patreon page yet, check out our sweet deals on Medieval Warfare Magazine, The Medieval Magazine, and our ever-growing book club. You can also choose to access an ad-free version of Medievalist.net, or you can even just kick in a dollar. <laughs>
Your support is what keeps this podcast going. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for every little bit of it. Find all the action at patreon.com slash medievalists. For all the latest information about the medieval world, including all the work by the new writers Peter mentioned, you can follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and here's to leaving a lasting, positive mark on the world. Mm-hmm.